All right, family, how are you all this morning? Give everybody a few minutes to get on here and we'll get started about 11 o'clock with our online streaming service. I'm trying a couple of things here. So I've got a phone set up so I can put it online uh, for folks that don't have Facebook. And then um, I'm doing it on live on Facebook right here on my iPad. So I pray that everybody is healthy and safe. And here in a couple minutes, we'll get started with a word of prayer, and then we'll go into the message. I hope everyone has, is dressed for church. My green screen is up. The boxes have been removed. Good morning, Renee. Thank you for logging on. I see we have quite a few. Good morning, Katina. Ah, Annabelle. Good morning. Of course, Anna. So after the message, I'm going to um, put a post on our webpage of what I'm wearing. And, uh, and then I'm going to encourage everyone, as long as it's clean, to uh, post a picture in the comments section about what they wore to church this morning since we're doing it uh, from home. So we got about another minute. And then we will go ahead and get started. I'm hoping by next Sunday I will have the worship music piece figured out. Um, apart from going into the church and actually doing service without anybody in the uh, sanctuary. Um, that's been a difficult one to tackle as far as music. I could splice in music videos and songs. Um before I put it on YouTube, but uh, as far as the live piece goes, I would definitely like it to be more than just me sitting in front of my iPad or my computer um, doing all the talking. Good morning. All right. Well, it is 11 o'clock. I uh, would like to start us in a world of prayer, um, but first, welcome to the live streaming of Turbeville First Baptist Church. My name is Ryan Glosson and I am the, the pastor. Um, it is my absolute honor and privilege to be online with you all this morning as we're facing times uh, like we haven't faced in a long time. So um, this will definitely be something that we will be talking about for a long time. Um, this is definitely something that will change the way church looks. Um, because back in Jesus' time, church was not a building, and we know church is still not the building. Um, church is the people, the body of Christ. And thanks to technology, we can all come together and worship through this type of medium. And I truly believe that this is honoring God, even though we're not together, we're not physically together, we're together spiritually. And I believe that God will honor this um, medium of uh, worshiping together. So let's open a word in prayer. And then we will uh, get started. Father God, we just come to you this morning during these times of the unknown, God, and we just know that you're in control. And we pray, God, for all those that are out there fighting this coronavirus on the front lines. God, I pray that we find a vaccine or a medicine that can eradicate, eradicate it quickly, God. I pray that we can get the church, uh, the buildings back open where we can come together, God, and we can worship and be a family, God. But we do thank you for the, for the technology, God, for us to be able to get together online. So now, God, this morning, I pray that you give me the words that you want me to say, God. I pray that you, you bless this meeting of the saints, God, the, this meeting of the church, God. And as people go back and watch it later, I pray that you bless them. And God, I pray that we do all this for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So, I have seen many online videos of, of pastors. Um, I have seen some where they're in the church with their worship group. I have seen some where it's just like me um, sitting in front of the computer. I've seen some where they're on their in their pulpit, and it's them and whoever's recording them. But I am excited about our opportunity to do it this way. I'm hoping that we can learn how to actually use technology to further the kingdom as opposed to um, acting like it's something that's vile and that's evil. Um, 
as Jay pointed out to me in a text this morning. Um, but good luck on your crops. Good luck on your corn. So this morning, I want to talk to you about sin. This is something that has been on my heart for a while now. Because, you know, as I have shared with you all, I grew up in a church, um, very legalistic. And some of you may still be going to a legalistic church. Some of you may still kind of have a lot of those thoughts and feelings. And I think for too long, churches have dictated what sin is. When there's only one person that can tell us what sin is, they can tell us what the consequences of those sins are, and they can tell us how we can be free of those consequences of sin. And that is God. That is Jesus Christ. You know, no man in a pulpit that I know of has ever died to cover my sins. So why does the preacher get to dictate that homosexuality is a worse sin than murder, or this sin is worse than this sin, or, or this is worse than that? We don't get to do that. We do not get to do that. What we get to do is we get to love one another. Sure, we get to talk to each other about sin. We get to talk to each other about what sin is. But there's not a one of us that's online right now. There's not a one of us that's part of this family that is sin-free. See, because it, Jesus said that for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we know that the overarching uh, penalty for sin is death. And without Jesus, you will meet that death. And that is where you get thrown into the lake of fire. You get thrown into the pits of hell. But the second part of that verse in Romans I love so much because it says, but the gift of God is, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, so we are all sinners. And it doesn't matter what our sin looks like. It doesn't matter what our sin is. What matters is that we believe in in the God who sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. And as long as we believe on that uh, promise of eternal life, as long as we accept the relationship with Jesus Christ, as long as we become believers, we turn our lives over to him. We're not sin free. So how can we sit here and get on others about their sin? How can we sit here and judge others when we're all sinners. Because we also know that in Romans we read that, that we're all born into sin. We're born into it. So if we're born into sin, I need, to, I, need to, I need some help understanding why one sin is worse than the other. Because I have never read that in the Bible. Now, there is an unpardonable sin, an unforgivable sin. And that is to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Now, there's many theological camps. There's many theologians that have different viewpoints of it. But that, to me, and all the studying that I have done and all the reading I have done, means that we deny the gift of salvation to death. I.e., you go your whole life, you know that there's a God, you know that Jesus Christ died on the cross, but you're having too much fun in your sin, you're having too much fun out there with your buddies, you're having too much fun doing whatever you want to do. You're doing what you think you should do, which is sin, right? Anytime that we dictate that what we know is better than what God knows, or what we can do is better than what God can do for us, that is sin. Anytime we lean on our own understanding, that is sin. Now, the sin doesn't get broke down into this category is worse than others. Now, yes, in our times, there are sins that are, that are so egregious, so against societal norms, that people get put to death for them, like murder and some other things. Some of them I really don't want to talk about on this medium. Not that I'm afraid to talk about them, but they're just so disgusting and just so, I mean, they're just... You can't even imagine what would make somebody want to commit those types of sins. And of course, on the earth, we call them crimes, but these are sins. But see, again, as I said, no sin is bigger than any other sin. See, and as sinners, the beauty of it is we have a, a, a God who sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross and in 1 John 1, 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins 
and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I mean, imagine that. That there is a God out there that no matter what sin you have committed, shy of grieving the Holy Spirit, shy of continuing to turn your back on the truth that is the salvation, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Shy of that. There's not a sin out there that can keep you from the love of Jesus Christ. That can keep you from salvation. And it's also important that as we talk about sin, that we remember, as I talked about in the beginning, we, none of us are blameless, none of us are sinless. And, and yes, even, even I have this problem where I will look at somebody and say, man, that's just wrong. They, they are sinners. I, I can't hang out with them. I can't do this. I can't do that. But I love what Jesus says in Matthew 7. It says, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? See, as Christians, for too long, we have been so focused on everybody else's sin, what the world is doing, what the world is wearing. Instead of focusing on our own sin, the salvation that Jesus Christ gave us, the cleansing of our body, he made it as pure as snow. He has made us as pure as snow. As soon as we become believers, our sins are forgiven, and it's like they never happened to Jesus, to God. But yet, for, for, for years, we would sit around and we would dictate, you know, oh, that person's living in this sin, that person's living in this sin, that person, this group, that group, this group. We're not supposed to do that. As we look at the log in our eye, and as we, as we examine that log in our eye, and as we look at our own lives and we look at our own sin, it is in that that we realize the grace, the forgiveness, the redemption, the love that God has for us. And then we're supposed to take that and we're supposed to go out into the world and show that to those that don't believe. See, we, we, we were never meant to sit back and judge. We were never meant to sit back and judge, but that's, that seems to be what we do. You know, it's kind of funny. I, I'm in some conversations with folks as we're going through this time, and you've got some people that were that were calling their churches, letting their pastors know, you better not close the door. you got pastors that have decided to, to hold certain services, to do certain things. And it's funny how quick your mind goes to, they shouldn't do that, they should do this, they shouldn't do that. Well, who am I? And who are we? Because, see, another thing that sin does to the church is it creates confusion. It creates fractures. It creates splits. And we can't expect the world to come together. We can't expect the world to accept Jesus, which we know they never will. But that doesn't mean that here on this earth, we're not under Acts 1-8 or the Great Commission. But we can't expect the world to act a certain way when the church itself can't even act that way. When we're so focused on what everyone else is doing and what everyone else's sin is, instead of focusing on the log that is in our eye, instead of focusing on our lives and how we can be better and how we can be blameless in the sight of the Lord. And now we're all sinners. We're never going to be perfect on this side of earth. Or I mean, on this side of heaven. <laughs> we're not going to be perfect on earth. We're never going to be perfect on this side of heaven. But I want each and every one of us to know, and each and every one of you to know, that there is a God that loves you. There is a God that dictates what sin is and what sin isn't. And to him, they're all the same. And matter of fact, he even takes it a step further in Matthew when he starts talking about, you know, adultery and murder. And, you know, it's not just simply the act, it's the thought. I mean, holy cow, if you think about that. The sin that is in our life just simply based on our human minds. Not even the actions that we take, but the thoughts that are in our human mind. It would blow us away. If you truly sat down and thought about how wretched we were, how much we do not deserve the love, how much we do not deserve the death, 
burial, and the resurrection. But yet here we are. And we need to take that. We need to take that and go out into the world and say, look, I don't judge you. Maybe what you're doing is wrong. And there's certain ways to have that conversation. But what I'm getting at is it's hard for the church to be able to do what God commands us to do when we can't even take a second and look at the log in our own eye and figure out what God wants us to do to take it out. Because it is easy. It's definitely easy for me to look at somebody else and think that I know better than them. I can't believe they're doing that. God, can you believe that? And I think about God just smacking me in the back of the head and saying, of course I believe it. We're all sinful by nature. But oh, guess what there, Ryan? What they're doing is the same as what you're doing over here. It's a sin. Sin is sin. Period. Dot. As a church, as the body of Christ, we need to, to, to put whatever we were taught out of our mind as far as what sin is greater than another because there are no sins greater than the other. Lying, murder, um, you name it. It's all the same in God's eyes. So it should all be the same in our eyes. When we're looking through the lens of love, of forgiveness and of mercy, which is what is the same lens that God looks through when he gave us his son, Jesus Christ. See, he saw a bunch of wretched, uh, sinful human beings, a bunch of people that didn't deserve anything. I mean, it took three chapters in Genesis for us to be banned from the Garden of Eden. So it doesn't take us long to sin. It doesn't even take us, it takes, it doesn't even take much for us to sin. But the beauty of it is we have a God who loved us enough to send his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the earth. He lived a perfect 33 years. And if you think about the fact that we just merely think about things we're sinning and not just doing, Jesus Christ, who was fully man and fully God, made it 33 years without thinking a sin and without doing a sin. And there's not a person on here watching, there's not a person on the internet, there's not a person in the world that will ever be able to match that again. So it's important that as a church, that we remember that we were not sitting down here to judge. We were sitting down here to love, and we were sitting down here to share the gospel. You're supposed to share the gospel near Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And I'll tell you, I am so thankful that I am part of a church that, that has a mission mentality as it comes to giving. And you ensure that our mission partners throughout the world and in the United States get to share the gospel. But we can't forget that we have a charge and that we are supposed to be on mission right here in our neighborhoods, in our homes, in our cities, in our counties, and in our states. So remember that as you go out and as you look at those people that you that you consider the worst of the worst and the sinners and your worst enemies. But guess what? You're a sinner too. And God loves you enough. And God loves them enough that he died for them also. So let's get away from labeling sin. Let's get away from determining what sin is worse than the other. Let, let, let's turn back to God and ask God, forgive me for my sins, God. I know what I have done. I pray for others. God, give me the courage to go and speak out. Give me the courage to go out and share the gospel. Give me the courage to be on mission for you. See, sin many times, and it, I mean every time, sin is what keeps us from being on mission from God. And the church has not helped in the sense that we have dictated whose sin is worse than the other. And anytime we do that, it keeps us from talking to somebody. It keeps us from sharing the gospel with those that need it the most. 
because we're judging their sin. So this morning, as, as we're coming to a close, I encourage you. I encourage you to pray with your family. Pray right where you're at. Pray that God shows you the log that's in your eye. Pray that God gives you the power to go out and share the gospel despite what you think, despite what you may, may think of that person, despite what you may think that their sin is. Because truly, there's only one person that knows, and that is God. So I encourage each and every one of us this morning to be on mission. Allow God to di dictate and determine what God needs to dictate and determine. And then we just read his word and follow what he tells us to do. In Matthew 28 and Acts 1.8. I look forward to when we can all get together again. Uh, I look forward to when we can worship together and, and you know, there can be music because, uh, again, I'm not going to sing. And I'm encouraged by the fact that there are folks on here watching and listening to me fumble through this. But I thought this topic is very important. God has laid this on my heart for a while, and I didn't know. Um, honestly, I was torn this morning between this one and another one. But you know what? I think, I think it's important that no matter how we're worshiping or where we're worshiping, that we still bring the Word of God. And that we not be afraid that just because this is now going to be on the internet, um, it's going to be shared, maybe, I don't know. Um, but I'm sure somebody can get a hold of it and pick it apart. But I don't care. Because I want God to use this however God wants to use this. And I know that I am a sinner saved by grace. And I know all of you are sinners saved by grace. So let's put our sinful natures behind us. Let's bury our sins, give them to God, and then let's go out and help others come to know that same freedom that we know as Christians. Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning for, for the folks that have come online to watch, God. I just thank you for those that understand the importance of being on mission for you, God. We pray for all of our missionaries worldwide, God, and in the States. God, I pray that you give us the courage to stand up and give us the courage to only worry about what we're supposed to be worrying about, God. I mean, it's clearly in your word what we're supposed to be doing. But many times we get wrapped up into who's doing what and who's sinning and what this is and what that is, God. All that matters is that they're sinners and that you died for them, just like you died for us. God, give us the courage to be the light in this dark world. Give us the courage to be the bold leaders that this world needs during this crisis. God, give us the courage to come together because we can't expect the world to act a certain way when the church can't even act that way. But God, I thank you for the saints that I get to worship with, God, that you have allowed me to be a part of. God, I thank you for this family. I pray for anyone out there that is sick, I pray for those that are dealing with this virus. God, I pray for the first responders. I pray for the lost, God. And I pray that you give us a chance to share your gospel, the good news, with those that need it most. God, we just love you and we thank you. And we just praise you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so tonight I'll be back on here at 6 o'clock. Uh, unfortunately, we won't get to get any of Tommy and Faye's uh, food, their gourmet food. So um, unless everybody wants to invite, uh, unless Tommy wants to invite everybody over to his house, uh, we can just like sit in our vehicles and then him and Faye can bring it. I don't know if you guys are still watching, but that would be cool. Uh, but anyway, I'm kidding. But thank you so much for being on here this morning. Uh, praying for you, Joseph, as well. Thank you for joining from Honduras. All the family and friends that got on. Um, let's continue to pray that we will be back together soon. Our plan is April 1st. But if any of you are watching the news, we need to do some some uh, uh, some management of expectations here. It's uh, Only God can do it. So let's continue to pray and pray that we'll be back together April 1st. And I, I love you all. 
and thank you so much. I'm available via my cell phone. Uh, also, if you're worried about tithing, which you can wait till the church doors open back up, you can mail it in, but we also have instructions on um, on Facebook on how you can tithe online. There is a fee, but you don't have to pay that fee. But it does give you the opportunity to be able to tithe even during this time. But trust me, that's the least of our worries. We're more worried about your health and safety, which is why we're doing this online. But if that is something that just God has, please mail it in. 